Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I uh, also want to introduce a couple of my colleagues who came with me today. Uh, Sharon Lafargue is with us. Sharon is the business lead on the project. Uh, Sharon has been from the very beginning involved. Uh, she leads a team of about 40 people uh, who have been engaged in doing the design work, uh, doing testing, and a number of other things to bring this platform to life. Uh, along with Sharon, we have Andrea Alfano. Uh, Andrea is part of the organizational skill and development area. It's part of uh, UConn, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Andrea has been very involved in the uh, training and education component of rolling the platform out, the change management activities, and a lot of the communications uh, work that has gone into the project as well. Um, just to remind everyone, the Impact Initiative is the modernization platform, if you will, to replace the 27-year-old um, old green screen system that was known as EMS. It's the new eligibility system for the Department of Social Services. Uh, this project began uh, approximately three years ago, and uh, the update that I'm going to give you today will uh, reflect how far we've rolled it out and what we have uh, yet to do in terms of uh, implementing the new platform in the field offices uh, and with partners like you. I know some of you are using the new system. Uh, back in October, on October 11th, uh, we launched our pilot. Uh, the pilot was in our Middletown office. There were about uh, 72,000 clients in the Middletown office at the time and we were able to convert over uh, around 60,000 of them, uh, which is about 83 percent of the client base in the Middletown office was converted at that point in time. Uh, the reason that we don't convert everyone is, uh, quite frankly, uh, data. Uh, we often have data issues in this old platform, as you might expect. Uh, there's a certain degradation of information over time. Uh, so uh, we go through a whole series of rules and checks, and if a record is uh, ready to convert, we convert it. Uh, yet there are records that are not ready to convert and therefore we leave them behind in the old system until we're able to review them, do research on them, assess them, and then uh, convert them later. Um, one thing to note is that, for example, in the Middletown office, even though we initially only converted the 83%, we're now up to approximately 92% of the client base of that, of that original 75,000 we've been able to bring over onto the platform. Uh, we'll keep poking at that and fixing data and we'll eventually hope to get uh, as close to 100% of the conversion as we can possibly get. Uh, the goal, of course, being that as we roll this out to all the offices, uh, we'll want to get everything off from the old platform uh, so that we can shut it down. Uh, the intent being that uh, that's a cost savings activity that, that will um, uh, save some money and therefore we, we want to be in a position to, to turn, that, turn that off. Um, Wave uh, one, we executed on Valentine's Day of this year. Um, wave one uh, was to include um, three offices, but we paired it back, uh, just being a little more conservative about it. Uh, we converted the Stanford and the Torrington offices. Uh, that accounted for uh, about 76,000 additional clients coming onto the platform. There were, um, in those two offices, about 102,000 clients. So we had a conversion rate of about 74%. Uh, that versus the 83, obviously, that we were able to achieve in our Middletown office at the time. And again, we'll continue to, uh, to poke at those, those clients left behind in terms of the data, get them straightened out, and we'll get them brought over as well. Our third wave is going to be uh, three, three offices, um, or pardon me, our third wave was three offices. Our third wave is two, wave two, pardon me, is going to be, I'm losing count. Our wave two uh, was Hartford and Danbury. Hartford is our second largest office, so that included about 240,000 clients, and we were able to load about 107,000 of them. So right at this point in time, we have uh, approximately 27% of our client base statewide is on the new platform and um, uh, receiving, their, receiving their benefits through uh, the impact project. Um, wave, uh, wave three, which is coming up on uh, April 10th, uh, wave three will include New Britain, Manchester, and Willimantic. Uh, New Britain will be the first benefit center that we load. Uh, that will be a, pr um, a pretty big load for us, and when we get done 
uh, with wave three, we should have somewhere close to 40% of the client base uh, for the state of Connecticut um, loaded into the system. Um, I mentioned the data fixes that we're doing and how do we keep up with those and how do we keep moving them forward um, along with any, um, any issues that we find in the platform or any enhancements we want to make. Uh, we do a release, what we call a code release, that's done. Uh, we do two between each of the waves, if possible. So we do have a code release that's coming up on uh, April 1st, and that will include some uh, fixes to some things that we found issue with. Uh, it will also include some enhancements to the platform that we've been trying to get into it as well. Um, and then after that uh, code release on April 1st, uh, as I mentioned before, we'll do our uh, next wave. Uh, which will be on the 10th of April. And then you can see from the slide that there's two more releases that will occur uh, between um, the Wave 3 and the Wave 4. And again, there'll be uh, two releases that we'll have between uh, Wave 4 and Wave 5. Uh, those of you who may have been here when I, when I was here previously, we had announced that we were going to be doing a pilot in two waves. You might be scratching your head and saying, what happened to the two waves? Um, we decided that the, the two waves was really a sort of a big bang approach and quite frankly um, we've seen some other states that have had some issues with the big bang approach. So we made a decision, <clears throat> excuse me, to spread it out uh, and instead of just doing two waves, uh, we decided to do five waves. We stretched our timeline a little. Uh, we were originally to be done in, in March. Uh, we will now be done in the June time frame with the five waves. Go on. <clears throat> In terms of the waves and which ones are happening at what points in time, um, I just wanted to point out that um, wave three, as I mentioned, will be New Britain and Manchester and Willimantic. Wave four will be the New Haven and Waterbury offices. That will occur on May 15th. And uh, Bridgeport and Norwich will be our final wave in June, uh, which will be on the 19th of uh, June. Um, bingo. Um, the, the rollout process, I just a uh, quick update on, on the process that we follow with our waves. Um, <clears throat> the training schedule is complete with regard to obviously the uh, pilot, wave one and wave two. We are right now in the process of finishing up training as it relates to wave three uh, and wave four. Uh, we'll get the wave five folks in there fairly shortly and some of them are already in there. We do have people trained in every single office on the platform at this point in time. Um, We'll uh, continue to review incidents. Incidents are uh, reports of issues that folks find when they're using the platform. Uh, sometimes there are defects, sometimes it's an issue that we just need to train them uh, on a process. Uh, we make adjustments accordingly in our training activities and our training materials, and uh, those get rolled out on a regular basis as well. Um, each field office goes through a fairly rigorous process um, where they have a bunch of communications that they share with one another on how to use the platform. Uh, there's daily huddles that they execute to make sure that uh, everybody's sharing information appropriately. Uh, they have a readiness checklist that they each go through and must finish and complete before they actually go live. Uh, there's some assurance strategies, which is quality assurance activities that they go through. Uh, and there is a standard escalation process that we ask everyone to follow to make sure that we're not losing anything uh, between the cracks here of um, what's, what, what the incidents might be in terms of uh, the platform itself. Uh, statewide support continues along the same way in terms of the daily uh, implementation news notes that go out. Some of you may be receiving uh, some of those in, in the email format. Uh, there's daily conference calls that occur every day at 11 o'clock with all the field and central office folks that are involved. Um, we have a support line that they can call into and um, there's obviously then ongoing training and follow-ups that occur. That's where we are. Um, why don't we take questions? Nobody can <laughs> <laughs> You might need the mic. They know all the answers. Oh, I just have a simple question. I'm oh, Carolyn Kyle from Eastern Virginia Park. I know these are the things you've done as far as they wanted to behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Has the clients, are they aware of the effect of any of their cases or their services? 
Yeah, um, there were uh, there was a brochure that we issued uh, to all the clients in any of the catchment areas uh, that went out prior to the wave or prior to the office shifting over. So they, they were made aware of it. Uh, we also had a communications plan that we executed that involved uh, all the key stakeholders. There were many, many of you should have probably received one of those. If you didn't, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what groups received the, the announcement that that was happening. Uh, we informed all the legislators that were involved in all the catchment areas as well. Uh, so there was a communication that went out to folks. Okay, what I'm seeing is, uh, has been smooth thus far. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. We have questions in focus. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Um, are there going to be issued new client IDs with the new impact system, or is everybody going to stay with their old client IDs? So anybody who's currently in EMS and had a client ID from EMS, they will retain their EMS client ID. That won't change. That will convert to the new system. Um, you will see a slight difference for brand new people who are never known to either system. When they come into impact, the client IDs look a little bit different. They have a, a different, they don't start with zero, zero. But those are just for the new people. So you won't see anybody that has a change. Thank you. Hi, um, I have a couple of questions. Number one, will this, um, will there be any change to the application process through Connect or the eligibility verification process for those of us who are um, checking eligibility um, through this D DSS map website? No, at this point in time, you won't see any changes for that. Um, the Connect customer portal will remain the same. We are looking at, um, in the future, revamping the application, the online application, just a little bit, um, but not significant changes. <clears throat> okay, and my other question um, kind of does, I don't know if it has to do with impact or not, but I represent the Healthy Start program for the Eastern Region, and my um, our caseers that work in hospitals have seen a change in the um, granting of newborn coverage for um, for newborns born to Medicaid moms and also to um, moms on emergency Medicaid. It used to be a very quick uh, process and it's gotten um, slower and slower and it's been increasingly difficult to follow up on uh, pending cases and I just just wondering if somebody could comment on that and kind of explain um, why there's been a change and if anything's being done to kind of remedy that. So what I would say is with impl the implementation of any new system you are going to see things slow down a little bit. Um, so I don't anticipate that to last any longer. I can circle back with the RPUs and see if they're having any um, problems that we can help address. But I would say that, you know, any, like I said, you get a new iPhone, it takes you a little while to get used to, where did that app go? How does that work? We're kind of doing that a little bit with our folks, but we are on the uptick on that. So I can take that back and see what's going on. Okay, is there any way that we can follow up with you for an update on that? Yeah, I can get your information before I leave. Okay, thank you. Hi, <laughs> I am uh, Lucy Potter from Legal Aid in Hartford. Um, just a couple of questions. So, Impact has is, are the new notices format? Will they anybody on Impact will now be getting those new notices? Okay. Um, Second is on your wage two, you say 107 of 107,000 of 237,000 clients converted, and at that 72 percent, do you mean 170,000? I think it's a misprint. Yeah, there, I'm sorry, it's 170,000. Okay. Um, and then third is just, are the how are the workers finding this? Are, are they? Are, is there any? Enthusiasm compared to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Well, some of them are out here, so they might want to respond to that. Um, <laughs> they do, you know, as with anything, you know, there's certainly a learning curve. And at first, um, as we totally expected, things were a little bit slower, especially with applications. But they very quickly um, come to speed with that. Um, as you can imagine, the training initiative has been a, a huge undertaking, the biggest that I have ever seen. Um, in my time in DSS. And one of the things that Connecticut has done is as people come out of training, as, to, as um, um, Matt was saying, 
Um, we have people trained in every office, even if that office is maybe not live. The field operations management has people practicing in, not, I shouldn't say practicing, they go into impact every day for an hour. Once they are trained, even if their office is not live, they are in that system. And the result, we are finding now that because that was happening, when the next offices are coming up in waves, that we don't have as many, it, it's quicker. And there's so much as um, other things from the, some of the Middletown pilot office staff are here. Certainly it was harder for them, but some of their best practice stuff that they've done is shared along the way. So I think the staff um, are, are happy with it, but of course, you know, it's a big, big change for them. Um, so we're seeing, um, I think, really good results. Hi, I'm Kathy from t um, we're finding that workers that are using the impact system are having issues backdating coverage. I don't know if you've heard of anything of the sort or if there's a training issue. Again, I would relate it back to the system being new. Um, the way we used to backdate in EMS was very different from what we do today in impact. So I think it's a learning curve. Um, we work every day with people. We don't have any known defects to my knowledge around um, the backdating of medical coverage. I think it's merely just we're on a learning curve. Okay. And secondly, the ID numbers, the client ID numbers that are being assigned, will those new numbers remain and, or will we eventually go back to these patients, go back to the zero, the numbers that began with zero, zero? Five? Yeah, the people who are issued brand new numbers out of impact will always stay with that new, with that new number. Okay, thank you. Hi, this is Cheryl again from DCF. Um, we were, we were wondering if there's any, are there any patterns of system problems that you can mention? Um, for us to be able to anticipate and message to our foster parents and clients to make them aware of potentially what could happen. We're, we're um, experiencing a lot of clients that are going for services and for example, it's, their coverage is active in, in EMS but not in the interchange system, at the provider's office. Um, it's not active in the provider's office. So we're just wondering if there are any patterns um, that you've experienced that you can let us know that are happening with the system. So I just want to uh, ask a clarification question. So it's clients who are still in EMS that are having issues or clients that have moved to impact because you had said EMS? Oh, clients active in impact but not at the provider's office. That's just one example, but if, if you could give us some patterns that we can kind of be so, able to anticipate. Yeah, so I don't think we have any patterns. On occasion, we have had some system glitches with the data coming over, and we've had individuals who may have gotten hung up in their eligibility where it wasn't on um, impact, but it wasn't being uh, given over to MMIS. We do have an escalation process that is for the internal users and the external users to escalate those up to the project office so that we can get those resolved. And we actually turn those around when we hear about them within the same day. I mean, it, sometimes it's within hours. Um, so I would say if you have not been communicated the um, the escalation process, then we can get that information out to you. I believe DCF should have gotten that escalation information about how it works if you have an individual who is not getting coverage or they're having a problem with any of their benefits. It goes up through your court, or I'm going to call it your court. Oh, your business owner. You would report it to your business owner, and then there's a process internally for them to raise it up to the project office. I can't hear it. Oh. Yeah, we have that connection. That wasn't my question. It was just trying to be able to anticipate, you know, what some of those system problems might be. Honestly, I don't know how we anticipate them because they pop up and then we usually correct them right away. So I don't think we have a pattern um, that I could really clearly explain to you. So, Thank you very much. Can I, can I just make a comment? So I, I wonder if it's a more general um, message that you want to say to DCF foster parents um, that if you have an issue around um, you know, health coverage through Husky, this is what you do, which is more general, not necessarily specific to impact. Just a, a thought. 
you know, how, you know, do, do, does the foster parent then contact the social worker? Um, so that, that's just my suggestion that may not make sense to you. Hello? Oh. Yeah, we, we have that yeah. pattern already established. So thank you very much. Other I have a question actually. So, so my question, so I assume people in the room understand that the system, the, the computer system impact is, um, deals with all of the different uh, programs that are administered by the Department of Social Services. So if you're on SNAP or um, Temporary Family Assistance, State Supplement, Medicaid, right? Yep. So in terms of the connection between Access Health CT and that eligibility system and the new impact system, how, do, how does that work or how does it improve um, the connection between those two systems? <laughs> so with the implementation of IMPACT, we've actually gone to the automation of the PDFs. So we do have um, real-time transactions coming over from Access Health. Um, they make it into IMPACT. IMPACT auto-populates the information and it goes off to MMIS right away. So somebody, as soon as they get their grant notice, it's going straight out through the system and they have their eligibility right away. Um, so that's, that's been a big, that's been a huge thing. It's not completely, that those are only for the folks in IMPACT, so just keep that in mind. It's not for the folks who are still in EMS. Right. The, the manual process still is in place for those, but the folks that come to IMPACT, they do have a real-time transaction into the system at MMIS. That's good, that's good. So one other thing that um, it doesn't necessarily affect um, a large population yet, but one of the things that we all ha also have done is we have passive renewals for our QMB um, clients now. So uh, last month we were happy to report that we passively renewed 2,300 of those individuals, and we are looking to expand that into our other um, Medicaid coverage groups. So we are working on that. Wow. <coughs> So I'm just going to translate just a couple things for you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yeah, just just so for people, I don't know, is there anyone in the room that doesn't know what MMIS means? Okay. Um, that, that's okay. Yeah, you know, it's hard when you're, it's like, every, you know, we all use um, shorthands uh, um, in our work lives and probably in our personal lives too, but uh, just see texting, right? Um, <laughs> But MMIS is their um, their medical uh, computer system, medical. So that that's where the providers right. can see or verify that somebody is on the Husky program. Yeah, right. Is that fair? Right. Yeah. It's it's essentially it's our interchange. So it's our interchange with all of our providers. So once Impact sends that eligibility to the to their computer system, your pharmacies, your doctors, your providers. That's what they're calling into to see if this person has eligibility. So it's our insurance housing. Right. And then um, the, you know, I've been around for so long that I remember calling QMB, QMB, and SlimB and all those. <laughs> uh, but, but people who are more, um, perhaps are younger and are newer to the world of uh, Medicaid coverage, it's also known as the Medicare shared Medicare buy-in buy buy um, or shared savings. Um, so that that's the qualified Medicare beneficiary where the state picks up some of the costs that a Medicare, a low-income Medicare uh, beneficiary or a Medicare enrollee would have to pay. So that's really great about passive, passive, re passive renewal just means the client doesn't have to do anything to stay enrolled. And that makes particular sense with um, with the people who are both eligible for Medicare and Medicaid because typically they stay on the program for a really long time. And as I think you all know and I know and they know that any time you ask a client um, to do anything, you know, it can, uh, not on purpose, but it can act as a barrier. People don't get the people forget they have complicated uh, lives so that's a really good thing 
anything else that people um, want to ask these uh, ask folks up here or comment? I, I mean, I have to say um, there are some of us in the room that remember when uh, EMS was born in Connecticut and um, I was uh, back then a legal aid lawyer and uh, Lucy and I and other people ran to federal court um, because we were unhappy with um, the fact that the new computer system was not processing or was not helping the Department of Social Services process applications in a timely way. The notices were really unreadable um, if anyone's ever seen or gotten those notices. So I have to say uh, that it's really fantastic. It's been a long time coming, but it's really fantastic that the department has taken advantage of the federal money that I believe 90 cents on the dollar, um, you know, the federal government paid virtually all of the costs to uh, implement this new eligibility system and um, it sounds like it's gone really well as these things do, you know, that, that we could have had enormous glitches um, and, and it hasn't happened and it's really to the credit of everybody in the department, so. Yeah.